Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your word that is living and active, and we pray that as we gather our hearts and minds around it, that it wouldn't be our thoughts that we think, but that you'd be at work in us, changing us, molding us, shaping us to look and think and be more like Jesus. In his name we ask it. Amen. Well, everyone's got an opinion, and we are going to play a quick game, okay? It's just opinion-based, no rights, no wrongs, okay? So I'll show you a picture in a second, and you just show your opinion by either a thumbs up, you like it, thumbs down, you don't like it, or kind of thumbs sideways, you don't really care either way, okay? You got it? Thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. Here we go. First picture, Nutella. Yeah, okay. I, you're definite mix, definite mix. Okay, uh, next one. Here we go. Spider-Man. Yeah, okay. Again, more mixed, more mixed. Okay, here we go. Uh, next one. Cybertruck. Yeah, okay. Is, okay, just, yeah, okay. Okay, yes, good. Uh, Monopoly. Yes. Okay, is anyone giving it? Yeah, okay, there are some thumbs down for this. Okay, it's just too long, right? It just takes too long, anyway. Uh, Chef Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, okay. Mix. Okay, uh, great. I think that's the last one. You know, I think for all those things... Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, some, th- some thumbs up, but they're few and far between. Like many things, okay, our opinion on lots of things doesn't really matter, okay? Some of you are wrong about spam. It is good. It's delicious. But otherwise, often we all have opinions and often it doesn't really matter, okay? If you like Spider-Man or don't, or like Nutella or don't, or like the Cybertruck, whatever it is, doesn't really matter, okay? But there are times, there are times when our opinion does matter um, because sometimes it's wrong, right? Uh, Your opinion might be... You know, if you ever saw uh, power lines that are down and your opinion is if I grab those, I can be supercharged and super powerful, right? That might be a thought, an idea, an opinion, but you will find out very quickly that your opinion is wrong, okay? And it it has a very serious consequence. We all have opinions. We all have different things we believe to be true or not true. And sometimes it doesn't matter, but lots of times it does. We're in this series right now talking about who is Jesus, right? We've talked about him from a historical perspective, and we've talked about the reliability of the New Testament. And this morning, uh, we, we've talked about who is Jesus according to Jesus. And this morning, we want to talk about what did other people in the Bible have to say about Jesus? What did they think about him? And it all kind of circles back to this question that Jesus asked in Matthew 16. Uh, it says this. I think we have a slide for it. Maybe I'm wrong. Who do people say that the Son of Man is, Jesus asked. They reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes on to say, you're right. There's a right answer and a wrong answer. I'm not uh, John the Baptist. I'm not Elijah. I'm not Jeremiah. I am the Messiah, the Son of God, the one and only Savior of the world. And my hope as we go through this, uh, because the reality is in our world, outside of these walls, there are all sorts of opinions about Jesus. In fact, even in this room, there's probably some different thoughts and opinions about Jesus. And lots of those are wrong, and only really one of them is right. And it matters. And sometimes when we hear those different perspectives or opinions, it can be jarring and, and shake our faith even a little bit, make us question or doubt. And so my hope is, as we go through this, that you would be built up and encouraged in knowing who Jesus is, and that when you hear those things, that it wouldn't rock you as much as it used to, but you'd be able to say, that may be your opinion, but I know who Jesus is. And then for those of you who are still questioning, hopefully this draws you closer to having a better, firmer, stronger, more confident understanding of who he is. That not only is he the savior of the world, but that you'd be able to say he's my savior. We're going to start just by looking really quickly at the Gospels. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, all give us a really quick synopsis of the reason for their, uh, what they're writing Mark starts this, uh, 1-1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So before he starts recounting what Jesus has done, what Jesus has said, he says this, I just want you to know what it's all about. This is all about Jesus, 
the Messiah, the Son of God. Matthew does the exact same thing. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. So before I get into anything else, I just want you to know, these guys say, this is what this book is all about. In John's gospel, he, he starts in a different way. He does tell us about Jesus, that he's the pre-incarnate word, that Jesus has always existed, that he comes to live among us. But it's actually as he gets towards the end of his book where he says, here's a quick synopsis. This is why I've written. He says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, that's the point. That's the purpose. That's why these authors write. This is who they believe that Jesus was after their interactions and what they've heard and seen about him. We're just going to look at John the Baptist. We, we sang about him. We talked about him. Uh, we're going to look at John the Baptist because he's uh, an interesting uh, person. He's very well documented historically. Uh, we know that he's a real guy. He really lived and breathed. Um, and when he sees Jesus, he says this. I already shared these words with you with the kids. It's not chapter 21. It should be John 1 at the very corner. Anyway, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one whom I will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I've seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. And so John the Baptist uh, interestingly says, uh, doesn't, we're not told that anyone else sees it, but John says, I saw the Holy Spirit come down, and God told me I would see this, and that's how I would know. John says as part of his ministry, this is the one. He's the chosen son that we have been waiting for. As Jesus goes through his ministry, there's these growing crowds around him at times, uh, thousands of people. And in John 6, uh, later on, we'll see that in the midst of those thousands of people, some as they listen to his preaching turn away. Uh, they decide they're not going to follow Jesus. Maybe they don't know who he is or they don't agree with what he's saying. And, and some of those people turn away. But there's, um, uh, there's this interesting account in John 4 where Jesus meets this Samaritan woman. You know this story at the well. And um, Samaritans and, and Jewish people don't speak, especially not a Samaritan woman and a Jewish man. Um, but as they're talking at the well, the story goes from the fact that they're both thirsty and both need some water to the well, and Jesus shouldn't be talking to her, but he is. And it travels to the spiritual where she says, you know, I know when the Messiah shows up, he'll explain all these things to us. And then Jesus says, that's me. I'm here to explain it all to you. The one you're waiting for, the one you're hoping for, the one you're longing for, that's me. I'm sitting with you right here. And the, and the conversation comes to an abrupt stop there. She leaves, goes into town, tells these people uh, all about what Jesus has said and done, and then they all come out with um, her to see Jesus again, and they say this to Jesus, we no longer believe just because of what you said to the woman. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So you have people like uh, the disciples or, or people like the authors of the Gospels who, who are telling us this, this is Jesus. This is the Savior. This is the Messiah we're waiting for. You have people like John the Baptist who says, yes, this is the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Son of God, the guy that we've been waiting for. You have this group of Samaritans, these outsiders who encounter Jesus and interact with him and say, man, this guy is the Savior, the Messiah, the one that we have been waiting for. But not everyone is supportive of Jesus. As you go through the Gospels, you know that, you see that. And so we're going to look at a couple groups uh, who weren't supportive, it didn't align with Jesus. Uh, one of the best-known groups would be this uh, group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. Here's one example uh, uh, of them disagreeing and not aligning with Jesus in John 10. It says this, Again his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And this was always essentially the rub with Jesus and the Pharisees. 
People will say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, but he does it again and again and again. And that's what gets the Pharisees so upset as he forgives sins, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. That's his claim. He's claiming to have the authority to speak on God's behalf and forgive people their sins. And here that pops up again. I think this is also interesting because it says, uh, no, if we go back to the previous slide, again they pick up stones. This is not the first time they try to kill Jesus for the very same sin of blasphemy, of claiming to be the living God. Uh, There's another time in Matthew 12, it says this, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him, so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So here Jesus is healing this guy and forgiving people, and, and the crowd is amazed. Could this be the Messiah we're waiting for? And the Pharisees say, No! He's not the Messiah. This, this guy's got demonic power to do this. He's empowered by Beelzebul. He's empowered by Satan. That's how he's doing these things. We know that later on some of the Pharisees do come to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, but there's people who are opposed to Jesus, and the reason they were opposed to him is because of his claim to be God and because of the, the miraculous and wonderful things that he did that idea that Jesus was uh, empowered by um, some other force other than God is something that carried through for a number of years in history, that he must have had some demonic power, or he must have had some uh, magical powers from some other place. One of the earliest known critics of Christianity who wrote a book called The True Word, actually, uh, was a guy named Celsus. And in uh, the year 170, Uh, He wrote a book called The True Word, uh, critiquing Christianity and critiquing Jesus and what he had done. And we don't have that book anymore, but we do have a bunch of that book preserved through a response that was written to it by a guy named Origen. And so here's what he writes in response to Origen. These were the claims Origen had said, that Jesus had invented his birth from a virgin, uh, that he was born in a certain Jewish village of a poor woman of the country, She disgracefully gave birth to Jesus, an illegitimate child, who having hired herself out as a servant in Egypt on account of his poverty, and having there acquired some miraculous powers on which the Egyptians greatly pride themselves, returned to his own country, highly elated on account of them, and by means of these proclaimed himself as God. So this guy, uh, 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 Cyprian, uh, or sorry, Celsus, is critiquing Christianity. He does not believe Jesus. But look at the things he tells us about Jesus, uh, that Jesus claimed to be born of a virgin, um, that he was an illegitimate child, that that's what people were saying about him, uh, because he claimed to be the son of God, that he went to Egypt. The biblical account tells us about Jesus' trip to Egypt, um, that he had miraculous powers. Celsus says he got those from Egypt. Those Egyptians have some crazy Egyptian magic, and that's where he learned how to do all these things. And on those claims, the ability of his magic, he convinced people that he was God. It's actually a lot of information to gain about Jesus from someone who's opposed to Jesus and trying to refute what he had done. So here we have this guy who tells us all these things, doesn't agree with Jesus, doesn't align with Jesus, doesn't believe in Jesus, but does tell us that this powerful guy went to Egypt, was able to do miraculous things, and claims to be God himself. The Pharisees said Jesus was doing miracles by the power of the devil. Uh, they didn't agree with Jesus, but they do tell us he was doing miracles. Celsus here tells us that he was doing uh, miracles by some magical Egyptian powers. Both those things tell us Jesus was certainly walking around doing miracles, and then people responded to them one way or another. People had different opinions, different views, different beliefs about how Jesus was doing those things. Jesus had conflict with other uh, Jewish leaders as well. Lots of those are well documented. Here's one of them. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. If we go to the next slide, it keeps going. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He's spoken blasphemy. 
Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Why does the high priest want to get rid of Jesus? Again, blasphemy. He's claiming to be God. The opinion of people really revolved or centered on these two things. Is Jesus who he said he is or not? Is Jesus God or not? And you have this growing camp of people who are saying, yeah, he is. Uh, the, the John the Baptist and the, the Samaritans and the, this crowd of followers who say, he is. Look at what he's doing and the way that he's teaching. Look at all these things about Jesus. He's absolutely God. And then you have this other group of people who for, I think, a variety of reasons say, no, he's not. He's doing these powers. He's doing these things. He's saying these teachings. He's healing these people with some other power, and they rejected him. There's another historical book, the Babylonian Talmud, and it's this collection of Jewish rabbinical writings. It's it's written over a long period of time from around 70 A.D. to 500 A.D. But, and so the earlier the things are, the more historically accurate we think they probably are. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. But here's one of the things from earlier on that it says in the Talmud. On the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, which is their, uh, what they're calling Jesus, was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald cried, He's going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. And so it's talking about Jesus here um, and that he was crucified at the Passover. Uh, Hanged and crucified are uh, interchangeable uh, thoughts there. It's interesting here, it says 40 days earlier, they tried to stone him, right? And we see that in the gospel accounts of Jesus. These guys going out trying to stone Jesus, picking up rocks and just get rid of the guy. Why? He's practiced sorcery, so he's doing miracles that they don't agree with. And then he's enticed Israel to apostasy. He's leading them away from the Jewish faith. How? By telling them, follow me. I'm the Son of God. I'm the Messiah you've been waiting for. There's these two different responses to Jesus. We see that again and again and again. There's more reactions to Jesus as we go through the New Testament, as we leave the Gospels and go into that next group of writings, the, the letters, uh, letters written by people like uh, Paul and Peter and Jude and, and letters by John and other people as well. Uh, Paul's an interesting one. If you know the story of Paul, he was a Jewish guy opposed to Jesus, trying to crush the church, to wipe out the church. Then he has this encounter with Jesus comes to believe in Jesus and give his life to Jesus. And the rest of his life is spent trying to tell people about Jesus and encourage Christians in their faith. Uh, From there, it goes into uh, the the writings of um, people like Peter. Uh, Peter writes this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter, this guy who walked around with Jesus, says, who is Jesus? He's the one who rose from, if we go back to the slide, Ken, who is Jesus? He's the guy who rose from the dead. He's the source of all of our hope, this living hope that goes beyond death. That's who Jesus is for us. Maybe you know this, uh, Jesus had brothers, Did you know that? Uh, A number of brothers, at least four, James uh, and um, Joseph, Simon, and Judas are listed in the New Testament for us. How many of you have a brother? Anyone here have a brother? Yeah, okay. What would you have to do to convince your brother that you were God? Could any of you do it? My brother, great guy. There's no way he could convince me, and there's no way I could get him either, right? No, look, look at me do this. Did you see my trick with the water and the paper earlier? Like, that wouldn't get him, right? It would just take so much. And we know as we look at the Gospels that the brothers of Jesus did not believe that he was God, that, that, that as they follow him along, that they're, they're not certain that he's well, okay, as he's doing some of these things. But then after the resurrection, they come to believe. Uh, One of the people that Jesus appears to is one of his brothers. And then in the New Testament, we have two letters written by brothers of Jesus, the uh, letter James and the letter Jude. 
brothers of Jesus who say, this is the guy, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, just like he said that he was. James uh, starts his book with these words, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, Jude, his other brother, writes, oh, maybe I don't have it up there. uh, Jude, his other brother, writes this, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. These people who were unsure about Jesus, who didn't know Jesus, who were undecided, who had various opinions of him, as you travel through the New Testament, all those opinions remain, that, that, he, was, uh, that he was the Savior, that he wasn't the Savior, that, that he might have been these other things. But as you go through, there's this unified story that also points us. It gets clearer and clearer that those questions and doubts may exist, but Jesus has shown himself through his perfect life, through the miracles he did, through the teachings that he thought, uh, through his authority, through his ability to forgive sins, that Jesus has shown us who he is, through the claims he makes about himself, and through the power of the miraculous resurrection of Jesus, that he is the living son of God. And you can have any opinion you might want to have, but there's a right one and there's a wrong one. What did people say about Jesus? There was a range, a total range of views. Some people thought he was uh, some demonic guy with demonic powers. Some people, like Celsus, thought that he'd got some Egyptian magic, uh, which sounds exciting but clearly isn't the right answer. And we thank, you, thank God for those faithful ones who saw that Jesus really was the Son of God from heaven who had come down to us. We see others like this... Uh, soldier at the foot of the cross who comes to believe in Jesus even as he watches him die. And in a way, it's uh, significant to hear all those different opinions because those opinions all still exist out there. But in another way, it doesn't matter at all. All that really matters is your answer to the question, who do you say Jesus is? And your answer to that will change everything else. Your answer to Jesus' question, who do you say am, will change everything else. Because if you believe that he is in fact the one and only Savior of the world, the Son of God who loves you so much that he gave himself for you, that will give you hope and peace for today. That will give you access to a promise for today and for all of eternity. It gives you access to the forgiveness of your sins, all the sins you've ever committed and all the sins you might ever commit and all those sins that you're still wrestling with, those addictions, those doubts, those fears, those habits, those routines that you're stuck in. You have access to forgiveness to all those things today through Jesus. Who do you say that Jesus is? It gives you a totally different perspective on the world. It means that you were created on purpose and, and loved and that you have a plan and that there's a, a purpose for you in this life and a hope and a guarantee for you in the life to come. Who do you say that Jesus is? My hope and my prayer is that you'd say that he is not only the Savior of the world, but he's my Savior. And he lived and died and rose again for me. And I know it and trust it completely. Let's pray together. God, this morning I feel like we've just raced through all that, through all those verses, as we look at what some other people said about your son, Jesus, as we look at what the Pharisees had to say and what the Jewish leaders had to say and what James and Jude and Matthew and Mark had to say about you. And Lord, in all of that, we skipped over the opinion that matters most, which is you, Father, who announced from heaven, this is my son. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So God, I pray for each one of us. I don't know what backgrounds we were raised in, what opinions or thoughts or beliefs, what voices we've heard about Jesus, but Lord God, may we hear most of all yours. 
knowing that you always tell the truth, that you never lie, that you've got everything perfectly planned and thought out. That there, there's no thought or idea or concept that escapes you. Lord, thank you for so clearly telling us who Jesus is and not only telling us but sending him to us to live and die and rise again for us. Lord, I pray for every person here for whatever they, they might be struggling with. Maybe it's grief or maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's struggling with their mental health. Maybe it's struggling with their mental image. Maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's marriage or uh, relational. Or maybe it's in their careers, Lord. We thank you that you're the God who is ever-present. And not just present as a passive observer, but that you're present. And as we call upon the, you, that you hear us and answer us. Lord, we thank you that you give us hope and a future. I pray that you draw each and every one of us closer to you to trust in your grace and your love and your mercy. For everything else, Lord, in our hearts and minds today, we commit all those things to you, trusting in your son Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil thine is the power the power and the glory forever and ever amen let's stand together as we uh, speak the words of our christian faith in the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life.